And so I'm glad to have our next guest on with us today to talk through some issues that I know are a part of the work that she is doing and the work that her office has been diligently engaged in throughout her career as well. Her name is Aisha Braveboy, and she's a Maryland state attorney for Prince George's County. And she's the top law enforcement in that county, responsible for the safety, security, and the administration of justice for more than 900,000 residents. She manages a budget of roughly $22 million and a staff of over 200, including about 100 attorneys. And she has implemented innovative and successful reforms to the criminal justice system to reduce mass incarceration, while protecting the welfare of her community. She tweets at S.A. Brave Boy. Welcome to the show, Aisha Brave Boy. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really glad you're here. Glad to have a conversation with you about the work that you're doing. I, I want to begin with one of your legislative priorities because I think it speaks volumes about really where we are as a society and our thoughts about the justice system. You are overseeing in part a conviction and sentencing integrity unit. Tell us about that. Well, thank you so much. You know, one of the things that um, unfortunately uh, exists here in Maryland is really a disparity um, in terms of those who are in prison in our in our uh, state and in our counties. Over seventy percent of people who are serving time in a Maryland prison are black. Um, we are we are roughly thirty to thirty one percent of the state in terms of overall population, but we represent uh, more than double that in the prison system. And when we look at the sentences of individuals that are 10 years or more in our system, over 80% of those uh, are black uh, people. And so we have the highest incarceration rate of black, uh, black people anywhere in this country, and that includes um, higher than Mississippi. And so um, as state's attorney, certainly my job is to keep our community safe, and I am focused on that every single day. But I also understand that there are disparities in the criminal justice system, specifically sentencing disparities, uh, that I can also address in this role as state's attorney. So I was the first state's attorney to decide that I would have uh, a, a unit that reviewed not only claims of absolute innocence, which is important, but also claims of unfair sentencing. And we have a unit designed to do that. We have worked really hard over the last three years, and we have uh, been able to get about two dozen individuals uh, either released or significantly reduced sentences, and we have several dozen more that are in the pipeline. So this work, we think, is important in helping to reduce mass incarceration and create a fairer playing field when it comes to sentencing. You know, it's interesting because oftentimes people think about the role of prosecutors as ending once the conviction results or the verdict has been rendered by the jury. And especially, you know, with the volume of cases that are before any prosecutor, I know this myself as well, with the volume of cases that are before us, I mean, you, you move on pretty quickly from the last case and often you're juggling many cases simultaneously. And rarely are you able to have the luxury of going back and reviewing the conduct of your predecessors and colleagues in a way that could change the outcome. But this, but this unit also looks back at cases and obviously involving, you know, prosecutions of prior years, but it also looks at the role of prosecutors in sentencing, even beyond the initial sentencing, the maintenance of it. Have you found it to be difficult in terms of straddling this role as on the one hand, being those um, prosecutors who will recommend a sentence and then coming back later to try to um, grant some sort of or appeal and get some semblance of leniency or maybe changing a sentence later on down the road? Does it show as a conflict to the judges who hear it? No, actually, uh, we have been very fortunate, and I want to just give kudos to the circuit court bench here in Prince George's County. I think that they understood um, what my office is doing. Uh, they understand that my role is not simply to prosecute, um, but it is also to administer justice. And what might have been just, you know, 10, 20, 30 years ago uh, may not look like justice today. And so as society, um, you know, becomes more aware of things like trauma, 
uh, adolescent brain development and the impact of brain development on an individual's impulses and actions. Uh, when we really talk about this idea of restorative justice and rehabilitation and what that means uh, today. It may have meant something different back, you know, 20, 30 years ago, but my job is to do justice every single day. And if that means uh, reviewing older cases, older sentences, using the, the brain science of today and looking at cases of, let's say, juvenile lifers and saying, hey, someone at 17 or 16 should not be, uh, you know, uh, convicted and, and sentenced to life, especially if they have shown that they have changed, evolved, become better people. They should be given a chance. My job is to do that, too. Justice requires it, and um, the judges have been very understanding and have been supportive of the efforts that we've made. Now, we talk about oftentimes in reviewing sentences, so much of the public's perception of the review of sentences, and I'm glad you've given the, the context that we needed here, has been focusing on, as you know, um, cases of exonerations, right? Cases where it's the wrong person who was convicted. We've covered these on this show in, in detail, and each one more heartbreaking than the next, and the amount of time that has been lost by innocent people. Um, but I do wonder, you know, if you could explain a little bit about how frequently your office is addressing issues of exoneration or absolute innocence as opposed to changes in sentences based on the criteria and the really the, the changing viewpoints of what retribution and punishment should look like. Absolutely. Well, that same unit also is our conviction integrity unit as well. So we do review claims of absolute innocence. We did uh, receive um, a grant from the Department of Justice to do that work. Um, and so we are reviewing um, a couple of those cases now. But to be honest with you, the majority of the work has been on the sentencing review because that's where the demand has been. Uh, we've had a couple of folks who've claimed absolute innocence, but the majority of those uh, who are seeking um, some type of relief are individuals who were who are not saying that they were wrongfully convicted, but saying that the sentence was disproportionate um, and so or unfair. And uh, and those are the cases that. I mean, that 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 we have, I would say 95% of our cases that we're reviewing are those cases. And um, I definitely support um, uh, individuals seeking uh, to to prove themselves innocent or to, you know, uh, you know, through the, our conviction integrity piece. Um, but I, I think a lot of people were convicted, you know, appropriately at the time, but the sentence was unfair. You know, I'm glad you made that distinction about how this works because, again, I think sometimes people think, okay, well, if it's not an exoneration, then that's it. Then that, the, that's it. The decision's been made and people lose interest. We always seem to, as a society, think more about the idea of um, absolute innocence as the only justification for correcting a sentence. And um, just the realities of how our system works requires a more expansive viewpoint on those very aspects of it. You know, what are some of the other legislative priorities you have? And, and I, I, I wonder, because I've been see, hearing a lot in the news generally, um, not only about decisions by certain DAs who are deciding not to prosecute cases or not to, pro not to prosecute certain charges. There was a recent discussion in New York between the DA in Manhattan and the police commissioner where the DA decided what the what the priorities would be in terms of prosecution, meaning I'm not going to prosecute X, Y, and Z or more nonviolent crimes. And there was a concern by the police commissioner in New York that that, that would maybe endanger the public or pose a greater safety threat to the community. And that they have since sort of reconciled on this issue and come to um, a, a clear vision of what they see. But how often do you have these sort of, you know, legislative priority discussions in tandem with law enforcement in general, the police officers? Do you, do you set the agenda and the priorities and then the officers are following? Or is it much more of a um, stay in your lane uh, situation for you and police? So, as you know, um, the role of a prosecutor is that of the top law enforcement officer. So, ultimately, um, what the prosecutor's office determines uh, are, are cases and the types of charges that 
the office will pursue is really all that matters. Um, but understanding that we work with partners in law enforcement and we all have, you know, uh, a similar goal, which is to protect our community, um, I communicate my vision um, and my directives uh, that I have given my office to our law enforcement partners. Um, often we will have dialogue about it, but ultimately it has to be the decision of the elected prosecutor. And uh, we have seen a lot of success. I mean, we don't uh, prosecute, uh, let's say, uh, uh, prostitution or, or commercial sex work. Um, we actually developed a diversion program, a very comprehensive diversion program, so that individuals who may be arrested um, on those types of charges, uh, we divert them immediately into programs, and they have been successful. Uh, we don't prosecute uh, minor drug possession, and uh, well, marijuana possession, not all drugs, but just marijuana possession, because of the, really of the changing views um, of the public and of the legislature. I mean, 10 ounces or less in Maryland has been decriminalized. So to, you know, charge people and to prosecute people uh, for possession really is kind of going against what lawmakers and the public want. Um, so, so we have had to educate our police department on those issues, but certainly drug trafficking and marijuana distribution is still uh, a crime that we uh, will prosecute, uh, but the possession of it, uh, we don't prosecute. Um, and so, and then there are other minor offenses, like some minor trespassing, if it's not related to, let's say, a domestic violence case, um, but it's a trespass, especially with uh, individuals who are homeless, we are in the process of developing a homeless uh, diversion program because what we recognize is there are, there are a lot of issues in society that government has not addressed, like our poverty. Um, and instead of criminalizing all of those who commit offenses based on the fact that they are impoverished, that we have to, as, as even as uh, state attorneys or prosecutors, uh, we kind of know where the gaps need to be, the gaps that need to be filled. And so we're working with some community partners to develop a homeless diversion program so we can direct these individuals to housing resources and other services that will be better suited to give them the care that they need and not the jail because the jail is not going to help someone who's homeless. Very well said. And, of course, there's other priorities that you have had as well in articulating. I'm most interested as well into the work you're having in terms of um, a form of gun control and, and the notion of ghost guns in particular. Tell me about what these are for people who may not know what qualifies as a ghost gun and what is being done about it. So ghost guns really come in two different forms. They're guns that are, you know, put together in kits, and, and uh, individuals order those uh, typically online, and the kits come, and the gun is about 80% kind of put together, and then um, the, the generally the receiver and some other parts uh, you have to, I guess, uh, assemble once you get the kit, and now you have a gun. Um, and then there are... 3D printer um, ghost guns, and these are guns that are developed really by a 3D printer. Um, and so the plans for that particular weapon uh, are sold or provided um, online often, and um, and people will buy, purchase a 3D printer and then uh, create uh, this gun. And so it is a huge problem because these guns are unserialized. So as you know, um, typically if a gun is is uh, uh, is used, uh, you can potentially trace uh, that the bullet and the gun back to a, a specific owner. Um, now, whether that owner says that, hey, my gun was stolen or I lost my gun or something like that is, is you know, that's another story. But you can typically uh, find out who the owner of the gun is. Unfortunately, with these types of uh, guns, these unserialized weapons, there is no way to trace back uh, who the owner is. And so it makes it really difficult to hold people accountable. And certainly the manufacturers of these guns are um, completely not held accountable because, you know, no one uh, kind of knows w w what gun was used, who sold that particular kit, and none of that is traced. And so for us, it's extremely important that we understand where these guns are coming from. We've seen about a 
40 uh, percent increase in the number of ghost guns seized off of our streets from last year to this year. Last year we had about 167 seized, um, and well, uh, in 2020, that is, and, and, and last year we had over 200 uh, of those guns seized, and so it's extremely important that we get on top of this, that the state takes a proactive stance in regulating uh, these firearms and requiring manufacturers to provide a serial serialization and serial numbers for these receivers so that we know uh, who these guns are going to. The other issue is that we want them to be considered firearms when they are mailed, because if they are considered firearms, then uh, we can better regulate who would be able to purchase and acquire these kits um, because there are people who are prohibited because they have committed um, offenses in the past. These are people who are prohibited from possessing a weapon. Um, and so there's a lot of issues uh, that we have with respect to a quote unquote ghost guns. And so we're working on, on legislation now to address it. So important to hear from you and your perspective of what's been going on. Um, I, I do wonder finally, before I let you go, Asia, and Alicia, sure. Alicia, excuse me about this very issue. And that's the notion in general, um, of, of uh, how do you think the community is, is dealing with what is often looked at as not only the uh, uh, issue of trust and mm-hmm. Aisha brave boy, you know, you've spoken about obviously the role as the top law enforcement officer and what that really means. And, there is obviously tension with the uh, amount of cases that are f- covered in the media, not that they began with media coverage and not that they will end with media coverage. And there are so many cases that have not that have yet to be addressed. What do you say to the communities at large about the idea of um, building, either introducing or maybe restoring trust between law enforcement at every angle and members of the community, particularly those who find themselves disproportionately represented in the justice system. Absolutely. Well, let me just say uh, what I have shared with my community is that I hold everyone uh, to the same standard. We have one set of laws and everyone has to comply with them, including our uh, law enforcement officers. I created a public integrity unit. That unit has indicted um, approximately 15 or 16 officers for from everything from a, a second degree murder to uh, assault, sexual assault, and a theft and other other crimes. So we hold our officers accountable. In addition to that, I have found that there have been officers uh, in Prince George's County who operate with bias, uh, whose integrity is not, uh, uh, you know, is, is extremely questionable and is not something that I want uh, to represent the people of Prince George's County. And so I have sent um, that list of officers to the departments that were impacted, and I advise the departments that these officers will no longer be allowed to testify on behalf of the state in Prince George's County courts. And that was a very strong message because what that said wasn't just that, oh, uh, an officer will be reprimanded if they do something wrong, but that there are certain actions, certain behaviors that would disqualify them uh, from testifying. Um, And so I I believe that as the state's attorney, my job is to hold everyone accountable, uh, to run a justice system that everyone can be proud of, and to set a standard that my community wants me to set. And that's that's how you restore uh, that credibility uh, with the community, by setting standards and holding everyone accountable. Really important to hear from you. Thank you for taking the time. I appreciate it so much. Thank you. Thank you very much.